Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of my Magic Formula Portfolio series, where I'm using the strategy laid out by Joel Greenblatt in his book, The Little Book That Beats the Market, and then also in The Little Book That Still Beats the Market. It's a strategy that tries to go for the cheapest, best stocks, and it tries to do that with earnings yield and then return on invested capital. And it ranks every company based on those two metrics, and whichever ones have the highest rankings relative to the rest of the market, those are the companies at the top of the Magic Formula list. And if you want to see the current Magic Formula screen, you can go to magicformulainvesting.com and you can filter by market cap and take a look at what's currently at the top of the list. But anyways, the last month has not been kind to my magic formula portfolio. If we go to the one month view, we're down about 10%. And that's largely in line with the current market pullback we're seeing. But the whole idea of using something like the magic formula strategy is to try and beat the market. Of course, this is over the long term. So you're going to see anomalies in the short term, no matter what. Pretty much any strategy you use other than actually just buying the market itself will at some point swing below or maybe above the market and it's not always predictable in the short term especially in the long term we'll see if this actually pans out and that's a big reason i'm doing this sort of experimental portfolio to see how it actually performs in today's day and age pretty much everything is red across the board this is still in the one month view we're seeing big swings down in a lot of these companies. And it is a relatively small cap portfolio. You don't see a lot of big multi-billion dollar companies in this portfolio. So in that way, it's kind of like a small cap value ETF and that you have a pool of stocks that are all trading with similar sort of characteristics based on very specific quantitative metrics. We can go ahead and take a look at the mix of companies and you can see it's very largely pharmaceutical stocks. I've documented that plenty in this series already, but it's a decently broad mix beyond that in that it's kind of a little bit of everything besides the overwhelming plurality of pharmaceutical stocks. And if you want to check out this spreadsheet, I always include a link in the description below. But in last month's episode, I talked about alternatives to the Magic Formula portfolio that aim to achieve a similar goal with a value focus. And I mentioned the acquirers multiple, which I definitely will do a deeper dive in at least one of the coming episodes. I kind of wanted to do it this time around, but got pretty busy this last month. And there's certainly been a lot of things to cover with the market recently, so I've been pretty busy with that. But I also mentioned value ETFs in that last episode where that could be a potential alternative to something like the Magic Formula portfolio that would be even more passive in that you're not actually managing the portfolio yourself. You are just handing it off to an ETF and maybe you can get a market outperformance that way over the long term, assuming you're really buying cheap, decent quality companies, at least relative to the broader market. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of that data. And we'll start with SPY, which is an S&P 500 ETF. And this will be kind of our benchmark that we go off of because this is effectively the broad market, at least in the US. If you're trying to beat the market with your portfolio long term, this is probably what you'd be aiming to be. And ETF.com has kindly put together some data so we can get a quick look at kind of the cheapness or expensiveness of the S&P 500 in at least within this SPY ETF. And this metric right here is the weighted average market cap. And we can see that in SPY, the weighted average market cap is about $654 billion. So very large. And that's partly because the S&P is really pulled forward in a big way by the top players. Think the FANG stocks among some other huge companies that really pull that market cap average up. And right below this, we can see the effective price to earnings ratio of the entire ETF. And that's currently sitting at about 25.7, which is definitely high historically. And that's not to say that money can't be made at these prices, but historically speaking, it is expensive. On the one hand, you could argue that people are factoring in really great growth for the future more than they might historically. On the other hand, with yields so low right now, especially in an inflationary environment, there's definitely an argument to be made that people are starved for yield. So they're willing to take on more risk, equity risk to try and create returns. And I might as well mention that price to earnings is not a perfect metric by any means. It's just a very quick gauge to see how expensive something is in that you're paying $25 in this case for every $1 of company earnings or almost $26 per every dollar of company earnings. So we we'll use SPY as a sort of benchmark. What about a value ETF like this one right here, the Vanguard value ETF? This ETF aims to track the US large cap value index. So that's what it's trying to do. So it's a lot of large cap companies in this case as well. If we scroll down here, we can see some of the top holders holdings in this fund. These top 10 make up about 20% of the fund because I believe there are, yeah, there's 355 companies in this ETF. So still very broadly diversified in that sense and that you have a great number of companies, but just 10 of those do make up a fifth of the portfolio with Berkshire Hathaway taking the cake as being the biggest holding in this value ETF. And if we head on back to ETF.com for this same value ETF, VTV, we could see that the current weighted average market cap right here is 160.85 
billion, so much lower than the S&P 500, the, the SPY ETF we looked at to start. And the price to earnings ratio of this fund is only 18, so significantly lower than SPY as well. So in this very one dimensional sense, just looking at the price to earnings ratio, we can see that this is cheaper than the S&P 500. However, I'm going to emphasize that there are a lot of reasons why a PE in one case might be lower than in another. And part of that is often with growth projections. If a company is projected to grow in a huge way, then you'd probably expect a much higher PE because you're factoring in that future growth. If you're buying a sleepy company that's not really going to be doing anything in terms of growth, then you'd probably want to pay a lower PE for it, all else equal. But in any event, this value ETF, at least in PE terms, is a lot cheaper than the S&P 500. But what about a smaller cap value ETF? Let's take a look at this other product from Vanguard. That's VBR, the Vanguard small cap value ETF that tracks the US small cap value index. So this is going to be much smaller companies, one would think. You can take a look at their top 10 holdings. And unlike the last one, the top 10 only make up 5.6% of the total fund. And we can also note that there are a thousand stocks in this ETF. That's right. A thousand different companies all encompassed within this ETF. So very broadly diversified in that sense. Heading on back to ETF.com to get a quick summary, we can see that the weighted average market cap is only 6.92 billion. So still pretty large, all things considered, but compared to the other funds, much, much smaller. And then the price to earnings ratio is actually 19.08, so higher than the last large cap value ETF, but still a lot lower though than the S&P 500. But how does this compare to my magic formula portfolio? Well, I put together some of this data and we can kind of compare. Column B is the approximate market cap of every company. This might change depending on where you're actually pulling the data from, but it should be pretty close. And this is in billions, so this 0 0.408 would actually be 408 million. Column C is the price to earnings ratio. And then I also added column D, which is the price to free cash flow in case earnings may be more manipulated, which is the case in some companies. There are a lot of different accounting tricks you can use in earnings. Not that free cash flow is a perfect metric by any means, but I think it kind of helps to compare both side by side when you can. So I averaged all these together and let me zoom in so it's easier to see. And the average market cap for the Magic Formula portfolio, this is an equally weighted portfolio in this case, is $3.19 billion, so smaller than all the other ETFs. And the price to earnings ratio is at about an 8.9, whereas the price to free cash flow is at 7.31. And we didn't have the free cash flow metric for the other ETFs, which I've included down here, but in general, it's pretty close to what the PE is. We'll just call it between seven and nine. That's actually less than half of the multiples that we're seeing for both the large cap value and the small cap value from the Vanguard products. And even compared to the small cap value fund, the market cap there was about $6.92 billion on average. That's actually double, more than double, what we're actually seeing with the Magic Formula portfolio, which is generally even smaller companies. And I think what this illustrates is that even with these value ETFs, it's not necessarily getting you the cheapest stocks. Of course, what is cheap really depends on your qualitative analysis of the company. But if we're just looking at current earnings and or recent earnings, I should say past earnings, these are much cheaper companies just from an earnings basis and also from a free cash flow basis, I would assume. And you could also make an argument that there's some more room for growth because the companies are smaller. And generally speaking, historically, small cap companies have produced more outsized returns than large companies. But you got to keep in mind, there's usually more more risk with investing in smaller companies because there's a higher risk of them failing than maybe a giant company that has tons of cash and an established business. You could always point to exceptions, of course. Now, you could make the argument that the Vanguard ETFs are going to have higher quality companies in them more often, but that might just be by nature of having more holdings in them. So there's higher chances of getting some of those higher quality companies. But then it seems like you'd be paying a premium for them because the PE is so much higher compared to the Magic Formula portfolio. So if what's really happening with the Magic Formula portfolio, if it really is the fact that you're getting the cheapest best companies, they're significantly cheaper. And if the ROIC, the return on invested capital, really is indicative of company quality, then you could definitely make an argument that you're getting a much better deal for each dollar you invest with the Magic Formula portfolio versus a traditional value ETF. Now, I'm not suggesting take all of your money out of Vanguard value funds and put them into the Magic Formula. I'm not saying that. This is really more of a hunch in that if the Magic Formula is actually doing what it purports to do, it seems like it would make sense to move money towards that rather than value ETFs. But I don't know what the future actually holds, so we'll see what happens. Now, the term value really is subjective. You could say that a company that's trading for a thousand PE is a value play because the growth is so high. So again, just looking at PE alone isn't really that helpful. It's usually kind of a first step, at least if you're trying to do an individual analysis on a company. But in this case, looking at a more broadly diversified ETF, like either the Vanguard funds, you would expect that PE to really not fluctuate all that much unless the market gets super expensive or super cheap because there's just so many holdings in 
there, you're going to have some that have super high PEs and some that have lower PEs, even when they have some sort of filter system to go for those value plays. But in any event, with the Magic Formula portfolio, the average market cap is significantly lower than either the value ETFs we looked at, and I imagine a lot of the value ETFs that are out there, and the price to earnings ratio is drastically lower as well compared to those broader ETFs. What you go for entirely depends on your investment goals and your risk tolerance, so I'm not making a suggestion either way. Definitely do your own research. The whole purpose of this series is to collect some data for the Magic Formula portfolio strategy and also take a look at some other more passive value-oriented strategies while we're at it. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes since I try to put a new one of these out every single month. And while you're at it, if you like this video, definitely like it since I would help the channel out a lot. And check out the free stuff and the affiliate links in the description below. But until next time, take care. Bye.